All right, so we're going to go ahead and uh, and get started. So we're in part four. What happens uh, uh, when you die? Part four. We're still uh, looking into the apocalypse of Paul, and uh, you know tonight we're going to be looking at the uh, the uh, first mentions of paradise and and outer darkness. All right, before we get started on that Hebrew nugget. Coming from a source we used a couple of weeks back, the AMF Monthly or the Jewish Era Christian Quarterly, 1897, and it was talking about the Chinese Jews. And uh, in in this one, it says that uh, our recent account of a visit by a Jewish officer in the German army to the remnant of the Jewish congregation in Kalfinku has aroused considerable interest in those pigtailed Jews. It was perhaps not unwise for a correspondent to warn students against the Ten Tribes theory, for whilst the history of these people remains very much wrapped in mystery, nothing is easier than to discover by a series of easily built theories that either the white or the black Jews of China belong to the missing tribes. Eldad the Danite, who provided the Ten Tribes theory, theorist with a sensation, described the kingdom of, of Kush at a great distance from Palestine, just now a place so named and so situated as to be either on the highway to India or China is being carefully studied by those who follow current politics. Uh, later on in that writing, because there's a lot there, he said, they told me that their ancestors came from a kingdom of the West called the kingdom of Judah, which Joshua conquered after having departed from Egypt and passed the Red Sea and desert that the number of Jews who immigrated from Egypt was about 600,000 men. They assured me that the alphabet had 27 letters, but they commonly made use of only 22, which accords with the declaration of St. Jerome that the Hebrew has 22 letters, of which five are double. All right, so that's a good resource. There's really a lot in there. So I just pull, pull a little excerpt out. All right, so let's get started. What happens when you die? Part four. Now we've we we went over a general summary, and then I sent out two lessons, uh, you know, this past week, and uh, went over quite a few things leading up uh, to this lesson. So make sure you you go back and review those uh, lessons as well. In the last lesson, uh, we discussed how the angels record every deed and how they report back to the Most High. Uh, of the things that we do on a daily basis. So we're going to pick up there and we're going to start reading. We're going to start at, at, at verse 11. And it said, uh, after these things, I saw one of the spiritual ones coming unto me and he caught me up in the spirit and carried me to the third heaven. And the angel answered and said to me, follow me and I will show thee the place of the righteous where they are taken when they are dead. And thereafter will I take thee to the bottomless pit and show thee the souls of the sinners into what manner of place they are taken when they are dead. So he said, I'm going to show you two different places. He said, I went after the angel. He took me into the heaven, and I looked upon the firmament and saw there the powers, and there was forgetfulness which deceived and draweth unto itself the hearts of men, and the spirit of slander, and the spirit of fornication, and the spirit of wrath and the spirit of insolence. And there were the princes of wickedness. These things saw I beneath the firmament of the heaven. So he's in the first and first, second, first and second heaven. And he's seeing these evil spirits. The spirit, he calls them the spirit of slander, the spirit of fornication. And uh, so we move on up into the next one. Let me get there. And he says, and again, I looked. And he said, I saw angels without mercy, having no pity, whose countenances were full of fury and their teeth sticking forth out of their mouths. Their eyes shone like the morning star of the east. And out of the hairs of the head and out of their mouths went forth sparks of fire. And I asked the angels, saying, Who are these, Lord? And the angels answered and said to me, These are they, which are appointed unto the souls of sinners in the hour of necessity, even of them that have not believed that they have Yahuwah for their helper and have not trusted in him. All right. So uh, these are people who are living according to their own rules. Uh, they're not trusting uh, in, in, in the power of the most high 
uh, to get by on a daily basis. And so he, he's saying these are assigned to them. So in Ephesians 6, it talks about these uh, wickedness in high places. And so it shouldn't be new to us. So, you know, he tells us in, in uh, verse 11 of Ephesians 6, he said, put on the whole armor of God that we, you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this world, against spiritual wickedness in high places. So when we read the Apocalypse of Paul, we see uh, this wickedness in high places. So it's not, this is this is not new. You know, uh, it's confirmed in the traditional scriptures uh, that we study. You know, then he said, and I looked into the height, he said, and beheld other angels whose face faces shone like the sun and their loins were girt with golden girdles, holding palms in their hands and the sign of God clad in raiment where on was written in the, in the name of the son of God, full, full of all gentleness and mercy. And I asked the angel and said, who are these? He said, uh, that are of so great beauty and compassion. And the angel answered and said unto me, these are the angels of righteousness that are sent to bring the souls of the righteous in the hour of necessity. Even them that have believed that they uh, had the, uh, the Lord for their helper or Yahuwah for their helper. So when we, when we see this terminology, those who have believed that they had Yahuwah for their helper, uh, you know, we got to go back to you know, those who have trusted Yah and trusted uh, the Holy Ruach that the Most High put in us when we believed on him. So the helper is referring uh, to the Holy Ruach. He said, I said to him, do the righteous and the sinners of necessity meet witnesses when they are dead? And the angel answered and said unto me, the way whereby all pass unto uh, God is one, but the righteous having a holy helper with them are not troubled when they go to appear in the presence of Elohim. All right. So, you know, this confirms, you know, what we, what we study in Galatians, when he tells us, then I say, then uh, walk in the spirit and ye shall not fulfill the lust of the flesh for the, for the flesh lusted against the spirit and the spirit against the flesh. And these are contrary to one to the other. So they cannot do the things that you would. In other words, we have these two things in us warring one against the other. And we can trust in the spirit and walk according to it, or we can trust in our own flesh and walk according to it. But he said they're doing opposite things. They're pulling at us. So we're experiencing both things at the same time, but we have to choose which one uh, we follow after. So we follow after the spirit. Uh, you know, it's it's a faith walk. He said, but without faith, it is impossible to please him, for he that cometh to Elohim he must believe that he is, and that he is a rewarder of them that diligently seek him. We read a little bit further, and it says, And I said unto the angel, I would see the souls of the righteous and of the sinners as they depart out of the world. So Paul is now requesting to see, uh, you know, the full uh, the full event. You know, when people, uh, you know, die and leave the world, what's going on? And the angel answered and said to him, look down upon the earth. You know, look down from heaven upon the earth and beheld the whole world. And it was as nothing in my sight. And I saw the children of men as though they were not and fell in other. And I marveled and said to the angel, is this the greatness of men? And the angel answered and said to me, this is it, this it is. And these are they that do hurt from morning until evening. So he, he's in the heaven, he looks down, he see how he sees how small the world is compared to uh, you know, the heavenly place that he's in. He see how small the men look compared to the heavenly place they're in. He said, Is this it? Is this the is this the greatness of men? And so it puts everything into perspective and you know and, and you know, you even hear hear it when, when the angels ask, Well, what is man that that thou art mindful of him, you know. Uh, because, you know, when you look at it from that perspective, he, he, you know, he could see how insignificant uh, we really looked. And he said, and I looked and saw a great cloud of fire spread over the whole world and said to the angel, what is this, Lord? He said to me, this is the unrighteousness that is mingled by the princes of sinners, mingled with the destruction of, of sinners, mingled with the prayers of the son of men. So those were like three different uh, interpretations. 
He said, and when I heard that sighed and wept and said to angel, I will wait for the souls of the righteous and of the sinners and see in what fashion they depart out of the body. And the angel answered and said to me, look again upon the earth. And I looked and saw the whole world and men were uh, as not and fell in utterly. And I looked and saw a certain man about to die. And the angel said to me, he whom thou seest is righteous. And again, I looked and saw all his works that he had done for the name of Elohim and all his desires, which he remembered and which he remembered not. All of them stood before his face in the hour of necessity. And I saw that the righteous man had grown in righteousness and found rest and confidence. And before he departed out of the world, were stood by him holy angels and also evil ones. So I want us to note that he said that the righteous man had grown in righteousness and had found rest. And so when we read the scriptures, the scriptures tell, tell us that we labor to enter into this rest. And so we have to grow into it. We have to continually seek after the most high so we can grow and labor so that we can find this rest and this confidence. And it says, when he, before he departed out of the world, there stood by him holy angels and also evil ones. And he said, I saw them all, but the evil ones found no abode in him. But the holy ones had power over his soul and ruled it until it went out of the body. And they stirred up the soul, saying, O soul, take knowledge of the body whence thou come out, for thou must needs return into the same body at the day of the resurrection. So they're telling him, you know, when he's getting ready to leave the body, take one last look at this body because you're going to see it again uh, when you when you come out. All right. Oh, uh, let me see. Then he says, receive that which is promised unto all the righteous. They receive therefore the soul out of the body and straightway kiss, kissed it as one daily known of them, saying unto it, be of good courage, for thou hast done the will of Elohim, which thou abodest on the earth. And there came to meet it the angel that watched it day by day. And he said unto it, be of good courage, O soul. For I rejoice in thee, because thou hast done the will of Elohim on earth. For I told unto Elohim all thy works, how they stood. Likewise, also the Spirit came forth to meet it and said, O soul, fear not, neither be troubled, until thou come unto a place which thou never knewest. But I will be thine helper, for I have found in thee a place of refreshment in the time when I dwelt in thee, when, I, when thou was on the earth. And this is... This is crucial because it goes back to the idea that when we uh, when we receive, uh, you know, uh, you know, our salvation, when we receive Yeshua as our Savior, that the indwelling of the Holy Spirit comes in us. And it says that, that the Holy Spirit stays with us until, you know, the day of redemption. So this is this is showing us this, that this, that the spirit is is testifying you know, on our behalf, you know, even in the heavenly, heavenly places. And it says, and the spirit strengthened it, and the angel therefore took it up and carried it into the heaven. And the angel said, and they went out to meet it wicked powers, those that are under heaven. And they reached it the spirit of error and said, whither runnest thou, O soul, and presumest to enter into heaven? How, how do you know you can just go in like that? It says, stay and let us see if there be all of ours in thee. So they're looking, these these. Uh, wicked powers are looking for anything in that soul that's of them so that they can make a, a claim on it. And he's saying, lo, we have found nothing in thee. I behold also the help of Elohim and thy angel. And the spirit rejoices with thee because thou did the will of uh, Elohim upon earth. There is a conflict between the good and evil angels. The spirit of error first laments. All right, so this is um this is you know a powerful this is a powerful event seeing what would happen you know when when a person uh, dies you know a righteous soul dies someone who's been seeking the most high and, you know trying to walk after the spirit and you know the helper is there the the whole way you know and testifying on the, on the behalf all right then the spirit uh of, of the tempter and a fornication meet it and it escapes and they lament all the principalities and evil spirits come to meet it and find nothing and gnash their teeth. The guardian angel bids them to go back 
So you tempted this soul and it would not listen to you. And the voice of many angels is heard rejoicing over the soul. Probably this is original matter. This is just a text they put in there. And they brought it up until it did worship in the presence of Elohim. And when they had ceased, forthwith Michael and all the hosts of the angels fell and worshiped the foot sole of his feet and his gates and said together unto the, the soul, This is the Elohim of all, which made thee in his image and likeness. And the angel returned and declared, saying, uh, You who will remember his works, for this is the soul. Wherefore, I did report the works unto thee, uh, you who are doing according to thy judgment. So, in the last lesson, we talked about the angels going and making these reports for each one. And so, now the angel is, is bringing that back up again and saying, this is the one who I reported the works unto you. He said, likewise, the Spirit said, I am the Spirit of quickening that breathed upon it. So, now the Holy Rook is testifying that that the man was born again because he said I, i'm the spirit of quickening that, that breathed up on it so he you know when the breath of life went into that man for i had refreshment in it in the time when i dwelt therein doing according to thy judgment and the voice of elohim came saying like as this soul has not grieved me and remember the the scriptures say you know grieve not the holy spirit he said like as this soul has not grieved me neither will i grieve it for well, like as it hath mercy, I also will have mercy. Let it be delivered therefore unto Michael, the angel of the covenant, and let him lead it into the paradise of rejoicing that it become fellow heir with all the saints. All right. So we see all of these things happening leading up to the, you know, the ushering into paradise. He said, therefore, I heard the voices of thousands of thousands of angels and archangels and the cherubim and the four twenty-four elders uttering hymns and glorifying Yahuwah and crying, righteous art thou, O Yahuwah, and just are thy judgments, and there is no respect of persons with thee, but thou rewards every man according to thy judgment. All right, so this is, uh, this is, this is really, uh, really good. Uh, there's nothing that contradicts what we've b been reading, you know, uh, in the KJV. And so we see an episode of a righteous man leaving uh, the earth and all of the things that's encountered uh, before it goes into paradise. Now, in this next section, we're going to look at a little something a little different. And said, the angel answered and said to me, Hast thou believed and known uh, that whatsoever every one of you had done, he be beholded it at the hour of his necessity? And I said, Yea, Lord. And he said to me, Look down again upon the earth and wait for the soul of a wicked man going forth of the body, one that has provoked Yahuwah day and night, saying, I, I, know, I know not else in this world. I know not else in this world. I will eat and drink and enjoy the things that are in the world. For who is he that had gone down into hell and come up and told us that there is a judgment there? And again, I looked and saw all the despising of the sinner, all that he did. And they stood together before him in the hour of necessity. And it came to pass in that hour when he was led out of his body to the judgment that he said, it were better for me that I had not been born. And after that, the holy angels and the evil evil and the soul of the sinner came together, and the holy angels found no place in it. But the evil angels threatened or had power over it. And when they brought it forth out of the body, the angels admonished it thrice, saying, O wretched soul, look upon thy flesh, whence thou art come out. For now must needs return into thy flesh at the day of the resurrection to receive the due reward for thy sins and for thy wickedness. And when they had brought it forth, the accustomed or the guardian angel went before it and said unto it, O miserable soul, I am the angel that clave unto thee. Day and by uh, day reported unto you of thine evil deeds, whatsoever thou wroughtest by night or day. So now he's telling, I, I've been with you the whole time, you know, and I'm the one recording what you've been doing. And if it had been in my power, would not have ministered unto thee even one day. Man, that's powerful. The angel is saying, I didn't even want to stay with you. But he said, of this, I could do nothing 
for Elohim is merciful and a just judge. And he commanded us not to cease ministering unto your soul till ye shall repent. But thou hast lost the time of repentance. I indeed am become a stranger unto thee and thou to me. Let us go then unto the just judge. I will not leave thee until I know that from this day I am become a stranger unto thee. So he said, I'm not going to leave you. I haven't been told to leave you. I'm not going to leave you until I'm told to. He said, and the spirit confounded it and the angel troubled it. When therefore they were coming unto the principalities and it would now go in to enter to heaven, uh, one burden was laid up on it after another. In other words, it just kept running into these spirits. He said, error and forgive, forgiveness and whispering made it and the spirit of fornication and the rest of the powers and said unto him, where goest thou, wretched soul? There is to run forward into heaven. Stay that we may see whether we have property of ours in thee. For we see not with thee and holy helper. Wow. And the angels answered and said, Know ye that it is a soul of Yahuwah. So the angel that's with him says, It's still one of Yahuwah's soul. Now this is this is a powerful statement. All right. So it it it's it's leading us to the idea that this is still one of his elect, although he's lived wicked. And the angel answered and said, Know ye that it is a soul of Yahuwah, and he will not cast it aside, neither will I surrender the image of Elohim into the hand of the wicked one. Uh, he's a, the uh, Yahuwah supported me all the days of the life of the soul, and he can support and help me, and I will not cast it off until it go before the throne of Elohim on high. When he shall see it, he has power over it and will send it wherever he pleases. And after that, I heard voices in the height of the heaven saying, present this miserable soul unto Elohim, that it may know that there is an Elohim whom it has despised. When therefore it was entered into the heaven, all the angels, even thousands of thousands, saw it. And all cried out with one voice saying, want to thee, miserable soul, for thy works which uh, thou didst upon the earth. What answer would thou make unto Elohim uh, when they draw near to worship him? The angel which was with it answered and said, Weep with me, my dearly beloved, for I have found no rest in this soul. And the angels answered him and said, Let this soul be taken away out of our midst, for since it came in, the stench of it is passed upon, uh, uh, upon the angels. So they can smell the foulness of the soul because it hasn't been washed in the word and then after it was presented to worship in the presence of Elohim and the angel showed it unto you who El uh, Elohim that made it after his own image and likeness and his angel ran before it saying oh you who are Elohim El Shaddai I am the angel of this soul whose works I presented unto thee day and night not doing according to thy judgment and likewise, the Spirit said, I am the Spirit which dwells in it ever since it was made, and I know it in itself, and it followed not my will. So this is another clue here that this person was part of the elect and at some point received salvation because he said, I am the Spirit that dwelt in it ever since it was made. And, you know. So anyway, uh, we can discuss that later, but he said, I know it in itself and it followed not my will. So the spirit that was in it said it didn't follow the will. He said, judge it, Lord, according to thy judgment. And the voice of Elohim came into it and said, where is thy fruit that thou hast yielded? Worthy of those good things which thou hast received. So the inference here is that he gave this soul something uh, good that could produce fruit, which is still pointing to the Holy Rook. He gave it something that could produce fruit. And now he's saying, what is it then uh, that you didn't produce anything from it? So he said, did I put a distance even of a day between uh, between thee and the righteous? Did I not make the sun arise upon thee even as upon the righteous? And it was silent, having nothing to answer. And again, the voice came saying, just as the judgment of Elohim, and there is no respect to persons with Elohim, for whosoever had done his mercy, he will have mercy on him. And whoso had not had mercy, neither shall Elohim have mercy on him. 
Let him therefore be delivered unto the angel Tyrannus, that is set over the torments. And I want you to remember those words that is set over the torments, and let him cast him into the outer darkness, where is weeping and gnashing of teeth, and let him be there until the great day of judgment. And after that, I heard the voice of the angels and archangels saying, Righteous art thou, O Yahuwah, and just is thy judgment. Now, I hate to sit up and just read, but this is just such a interesting, uh, I think it's worthy of the read to go over and hear it again. All right, so we see two different situations. We saw uh, a righteous man who had lived according to uh, the direction of the Holy Rook and one who did not. We saw one uh, going through all of the uh, evil spirits, the, you know, the uh, evil angels. Uh, they're trying to find something that they had in him. They couldn't. He had the Holy Rook as the helper and was escorted into paradise. We see another one come in. That he, you know, he didn't do anything with what he had. And he, you know, the Most High asked him for his fruit, didn't have any, didn't have, you know, hadn't produced anything. And so he was cast into outer darkness. All right. So what we're going to do, we're going to go to the traditional scriptures and we're going to see if this plays out. Can we verify this? All right. Before we do, we're going to go to this parable that Yeshua has, and he talks about goods, he talks about talents, and he talks about usury. All right, so the goods uh, in, in this particular, uh, you know, on the common level is just possessions or goods. All right. But when you dig deeper into those words, it, it's talking about to make a beginning or, or, the, the, or the thing from the beginning. So... In this text, remember when he says that he gave him his goods, he's he's really implying that he gave him that which was there in the beginning. All right. So uh, when we go to John, it says in the beginning, uh, where's the word? And the word was God, where it was with God. So the inference here is that the goods that's being given is his son. This, But this is not, you, you know, this is not for everybody. This is... Uh, you know, the mysteries of the kingdom are given to us, right? So he's saying, I'm I'm giving you my son. All right. And then he uses the word talents. And so uh for Israel, uh he you know, talents we we measured gold and silver uh in talents. And when we look at gold uh from a spiritual perspective, gold represents number one deity and that it came down from heaven, and silver represents redemption. So we got two things here. We got in the in the beginning, uh, the one who was there from the beginning, uh, coming down from heaven, the deity coming down from heaven, who's sent to redeem uh, mankind. And then we have usury. So when we dig in the word usury, it signifies birth or the act of bringing forth. And then you dig down and it says to bring forth or to bear or produce seed. All right. So this is important. So the inference here in this particular parable is that he sent his son, uh, you know, uh, from the in beginning, the son that was there from the beginning. He sent him down. Uh, he was the de he was deity. He sent him down to redeem mankind, and he sent him to give us, uh, you know, a birth so we could bring about fruit. So let's read this. In that context, Matthew 25, 14 through 22, where the kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a foreign country. So when we see the kingdom of heaven is as, it says, this is how you can look at what's going on here and you can relate it to the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is as a man traveling into a foreign country who called his own servants and delivered unto them his goods. All right. And unto one he gave five talents, to another two, and to another one, to every man according to his self ability, and straightway took his journey. Then he that had received the five talents went and traded with the same and made them other five talents. And likewise, he that had received two, he also gained other two. But he that had received one went and digged in the earth 
and he of his Lord's money. After a long time, the Lord of those servants cometh and reckoned it with them. And so he that had received five talents came and brought other five, saying, Lord, thou deliverest unto me five talents. Behold, I have gained beside them five talents more. His Lord said to him, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Thou hast been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. He also that had received two talents came and said, Lord, thou deliverest unto me two talents. Behold, I have gained two other talents beside them. His Lord said to him, well done, good and faithful servant. Thou has been faithful over a few things. I will make thee ruler over many things. Enter thou into the joy of thy Lord. Then he which had received the one talent came and said, Lord, I knew that thou art a hard man reaping where thou hast not sown, and gathering where thou hast not straw, and I was afraid, and went and hid thy talent in the earth, lo, thou uh, hast this as thine. And his Lord answered and said to him, Thou wicked and slothful servant, thou knewest that I reap where I sowed not, and gather where I have not straw, thou oughtest therefore to have put my money to the exchanges, and then at my coming I should have received my own with usury. Take therefore the talent from him, and give it unto him which has ten talents. For unto every one that has, has shall be given, and he shall have abundance. But from him that had not shall be taken away even that which he had, and, he, and cast ye the unprofitable servant into outer darkness. There shall be weeping and gnashing of teeth. All right, so I'm going to ask the question, does this parable now make more sense to you after having read uh, the apocalypse of Paul. Absolutely. Okay. So, <laughs> <laughs> okay, so, so it's kind of eye opening now, right? So we read this, we see a whole different, a whole different perspective. We see three who were in agreement with him, who received the goods, and the good, you know, is pointing to the, uh, you know, the in the beginning or the sun, uh, you know. They received, uh, you know, the grace and the mercy, redemption represented in the silver. And he said, what are you going to do with your redemption? And you had two that did something. You had one that did. All right. So let's go to the next one here. And this will be the last one we'll have. We can discuss. All right. This is a familiar one as well. Matthew 18, 23. And it said, therefore is the kingdom of heaven likened unto a certain king which would take account of his servants. And when he had begun to reckon, one was brought to him which owed him 10,000 talents. But for as much as he had not to pay, his Lord commanded him to be sold, and his wife and children, all that he had in payment to be made. The servant therefore fell down and worshipped him, saying, Lord, have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. Then the Lord that servant was moved with compassion, loosed him, and forgave him the debt. But the same servant went out, same one, same servant, and found one of his fellow servants, which owed him a hundred pence. And he laid hands on him and took him by the throat, saying, Pay me that thou owest. And his fellow servant fell down at his feet and besought him, saying, Have patience with me, and I will pay thee all. And he would not, but went and cast him into prison till he should pay the debt. So when his fellow servants saw what was done, they were very sorry and came and told unto their Lord all that was done. Then his Lord, after that he had called him, said to him, O thou wicked servant, I forgave thee all that debt, because thou desired me. Should not thou also have had compassion on thy fellow servants, even as I had pity on thee? And his Lord was raw to deliver him to the tormentors. I'm going to read that again. And his Lord was wrong and delivered him to the tormentors till he should pay all that was due unto him. All right. So then he makes this statement. So likewise, shall my heavenly father do also unto you. If ye from your hearts forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. I'm going to say it again. So likewise. Shall my heavenly Father do also unto you, 
if you forgive, if you from your heart forgive not everyone his brother their trespass. Now that's a pretty strong statement, don't you think? All right. So you see what's going on here. Most High said, "I had mercy on you," and so my expectation is for you to have mercy on others. So when we go back to to the apocalypse, and he starts talking about you know if you can't give mercy, I'm not giving you any. So we see him saying, "I'm gonna deliver you to the tormentors." He's not he's not lying to us. He's telling us what's going to happen. You know, just because it's not taught doesn't mean it's not going to happen. Right? And so then we read the Apocalypse of Paul, we see that actually going on. So, um, I wanted to go over those two just as an example uh, you know, to show you that these two things you know, are you know, flowing together. All right? So let me see. Let's stop there. All right. Uh, Mr. Daniels had a question. Uh, <laughs> I have more of a declaration and a statement. Uh, as, as a disciple of uh, Yeshua, um, you know, you hear some of these parables and scriptures read in certain contexts and, you know, in certain settings, church, so on and so forth. And I, I, I feel disgusted because without this information, we were only getting half of the story and hearing these things ties in everything else that I have learned in my 20 something plus years as a disciple of Christ. And what makes me mad is that I was told, do not touch, do not look, do not taste. These are not canon. They, they, they don't belong. But as you are reading these things, my spirit is rejoicing because they, they, um, they bear witness to all the other things that I have learned and heard and read. And now here is the backside of that story. This is why Jesus said this. And this is why the, these parables, uh, you know, made sense to, you know, uh, the Hebrews in the first century or, you know, so on and so forth. And um, it's I'm, I'm super grateful that I'm getting to hear this. Uh, I'm grateful that this information was not lost. Um, the, the and then the to the other to the other side of that, just hearing all these different things that are happening to these individuals and Paul sees these people, the the wicked and the good and the stench, and it's just so poignant when you hear these things, and it's so convicting. And I believe that people who are just reading the Gospels today or who are being spoon fed the gospel, whether you're drinking milk or eating meat, there's no real uh, there. The tools to convict a person to change have been dulled down because none of these other wedding stones are being used to sharpen uh, the individual who's hearing the gospel, who's hearing the word, whether you are new to the gospel, you've never heard it, uh, you, you say you're an atheist, agnostic, so on and so forth, or even as an individual like myself who's been around the gospels from the day that I was born, uh, these are the things that help continue to sharpen your mind and to sharpen your spirit and to convict you when you feel like, okay, well, you know what, I'm just going to let go. I don't really feel like being a disciple. I don't really feel like you know, listening to the precepts and following God's word. But these are the things that jolt you back into uh, obedience. Now, I know that God is not trying to scare us into obedience, but the reality of hell and separation from uh, God should scare you in addition to when you hear these things. And um, I just want to thank you for uh Taking the time to read it, I know that sometimes it may be arduous, but the scripture says faith comes by hearing and hearing by the word of God. And hearing you you 
talk about it and um, and then explain certain things. And, you know, it just it helps me and I'm sure it helps a lot of other people in this uh, group as well. So uh, with that, thank you very much. I appreciate it. Yes, sir. And then I, I, I'm going to get with Shannon. Then I got a question I want to ask you. Shannon? Oh, you can go ahead, Kendall. I can wait. <laughs> no, no, I'm good. Go ahead. Shalom, Max. <laughs> <laughs> Hey, so you know what? That's that's very convicting what you was talking about with the, the servant and, um, you know, the king and the servant and then the other guy owing him. Can't we go to God and say, oh, Lord, you see what they doing to me and this and that, da, 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 and don't have no clue that God is saying, OK, you got to forgive this dude over here that did you wrong so I can forgive you. We are so freaking guilty of that. Every single time, Kendall, we so guilty. And that convicted me because I was like, Lord, okay, I got to forgive this person. Regardless of what they've done, I got to forgive them. Yeah, and it's a realization of his uh, of the debt that he released us on, the great debt that he released us on. And he's saying, if you understand what I released on you, then the minor violations that someone has against you, you and you alone compared to you know the what i had to let go of is is really so small that i'm expecting you to be able to let go you know and if you don't you're not really grasping the amount of grace and mercy that i have given to you you're not getting it so that leads me into my next question and if what if 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 we see uh, you know, uh, someone who's going into this out of darkness. Uh, I just want to see if, if you're catching this. Is that a permanent thing? The out of darkness. That no. was one of the things that struck me. Sorry, brother. Didn't mean to jump in there on you like that. That was one of the things that struck me during this whole thing was that there's an, there, there is a, a, a time frame or punishment that happens but it it seems like even even during those moments, God is still being merciful and looking for ways to find you uh, to get you into His rest. And I would agree with the brother that just said no. All right, and so so that's good. But why? Because our salvation is not based upon our works, but He wants us to understand His grace and His mercy. And if we don't give mercy, what that's telling him is we don't really understand his grace and his mercy. And so if you're going to be part of this kingdom, I need you to understand it. So I got to burn off all of that stuff, uh, you know, that, that you're bringing in here so that you can understand my grace and my mercy. That makes sense. So he's saying, before I present you to my yeah. father, you're going to look just like me. All right. So this is a this is a very important. Uh, you know, like I said, and I agree with you. It, it's arduous to read it, but it it was necessary, I think, to read it so that we can uh, we can see this. We we need to be able to see this, and then once you see this, and then you can go back and apply it to now what Yeshua is saying in the Gospels. It makes perfect sense. All right, uh, Mr. Mack. All right. Hey, Ak, how you doing? Better than I deserve. You. Same here. Better than I deserve. All right. So it's good to be online with everyone. Thank you all for, for just being uh being awesome. I thank you for being amazing. Thank you for us. But I got I gotta I gotta play devil's advocate here. All right. All right, go ahead. All right. So having having read what we just read. Where does and how do we how would we approach um or how should we approach um what is it Matthew I'm sorry not Matthew Luke hang on one second here real quick I just had it in front of me um um so sorry so Luke I just had it how did I lose the page just that quick I look silly I'm online. <laughs> uh, he said the disciples it possible 
There's one. Okay, here it is. In and, and chapter 17 of Luke, he said unto his disciples, it is impossible that offenses will come, but woe unto him through whom they come. It were better for him that he be, that a millstone tied hanging around his neck, and that he, that he should offend. Verse thirty-three says, "Take heed to yourselves: if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him; and if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, uh, seven, seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn again to thee and say, I repent, thou shalt." Forgive him. So I just want to get your, your your feedback on how this is contextualized and what we're reading right now. Because, you know, there are people who will argue, well, you know, it, the, the scripture kind of gives me license to hold something against a person if they if they don't if they don't repent. If they don't if, if they don't if their trespass against me remains unrepentant, I'm in I'm I'm legally or uh, 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 authorized to hold a grudge. So uh, would you go ahead, would you please uh, comment on that? I appreciate it. All right, Luke 17. Uh-huh. And we're... Uh, I, just to interject there, I, I didn't get that from that scripture when you read it. That wasn't the, the interpretation that I got. Respectfully, uh, I it wasn't my quite it wasn't quite my interpretation. I'm just like I said, I'm 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 arguing the devil's advocate side. For right. those for those who would say, well, this is my clause. This is my out. For, but does the scripture say that? That Because from what I understand, it says, if someone sins against you seven times 70, basically what he's, it's a metaphor for saying, it doesn't matter how many times someone sins against you. As a believer, you are obligated to forgive that person. And if I remember from what I've read and what I understood is that he says, if a brother, meaning right. another believer, not someone who is in the world, yet they still get the forgiveness. But as believers, Jesus says, they will know that you are my disciples by how you love one another. So I, I, allowing. Go ahead. No, I, I don't I don't necessarily disagree with what you're saying. But what I'm saying is this is a passage of scripture that those who that those who have the intent or the desire to wiggle out of what we've just been studying might use or could potentially use in a defense, not for the, which, not for the most high saying it. Which, which part of that scripture would someone use as a defense? Because I didn't hear anything in there that says that unless they do X, that you are able to then use that as a way out. Well, um, I, just, I, I see what you're saying. I just wanted to get, I wanted to get, our brother's take on it real quick, and then I, I, I'm going to clarify a little bit, if I may. But okay, I just want to Roger that. Roger that. All right. So in in uh, in this one, he's he's. Um, I'm gonna read it again because it was going in and out. So he said, then said he unto the disciples, "It is impossible that but that offenses will come." He said, so he's telling us that things are going to happen. It's impossible that things are not going to come against you. He said, but woe to him through whom they come. He said, it were better for him that a milestone were hanged by his neck and cast in the sea that, that he should offend one of these little ones. All right. So, the, the, you know, so now we got to look at what this word offend means and, and why uh, Yeshua is so strong with these words. To offend means to cause one to begin to distrust in one in whom he ought to trust and obey. So it's really putting things in front of him to cause him to to not believe uh in in the way that one should believe in Yah himself. So that's a big deal. And he said if if you're intentionally putting these these uh things in the way to intentionally cause someone to begin to distrust in the one in whom he ought to trust and obey. You you it would better if you if you uh you know Put a millstone hanging by his neck. So he said, then he turns around and he said, take heed to yourself. All right. So he said, now I want you to examine yourself. He said, because, you know, you've got things that I have let go on you. So you need to look at yourself. 
And he said, if that brother trespasses against you, I, you know, after you have took heed to yourself, he said, rebuke him. Let him know uh, that what he has done. And if he repent, forgive him. And if he trespass against thee seven times in a day, and seven times in a day turn uh, again to thee, saying, I repent, thou uh, shalt forgive him. So what, I, what I'm understanding is not from our perspective that we, we can hold on to these things until that person uh, says something. Uh, you know, that's something that's required of us anyway. What my understanding is of it is that, you know, if he repents and he approaches me with it, then I need to I need to let him know that he's forgiven. I believe that along the very same lines, I, but I've heard it argued and, and by the camps, I've heard it argued. And they've used this passage of scripture to justify holding vitriol and anger in their own hearts against themselves. But if you look at that passage of scripture, he says, and uh, it, uh, uh, forgive me, uh, uh, take heed, like you said, take heed to yourselves. The Most High, Yeshua, he's redirecting that, that, that anger, that unforgiveness, he's redirecting it back to the person through whom it's coming. And he's saying, look at your own actions before you before you hearken this thing. But there, but there are those who will twist it and they will say, they, they'll they'll pass that and they'll say, if thy brother, if thy brother trespass against thee, rebuke him, and, and if he repent, forgive him. They go, they use those two words, if thy brother, or actually three words, though, if thy brother, and then if he repent, as a clause, almost like a legal argument that, well. He didn't repent. Well, how do you know he didn't repent? How do you how how to how how are we to determine the the heart of another man in that respect? But I've heard it argued. I've heard this is where I'm asking you this question. I've heard it argued that this is the reason why or 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 position that a person can take, particularly among the camps against those who who uh who we consider our who have who who they consider their enemies. Um that they can hold vitriol and anger and, and, and unforgiveness in their own hearts against the particular people who have not repented. But who are we to determine whether a person has repented? I'll give yeah, it back to you. Yeah, yeah but that's, I, I'm with you and I understand the, uh, you know, devil advocate's argument. I appreciate it because it's necessary for us to look at the perspectives. I, I just don't think, I, I, I that's not the heart of Yeshua. Right. Because Yeshua is so ready to let me know that he's going to let this thing go on me. It, it's he's he's eager to let it go on me. He's just waiting for me to to realize myself that I need it. Yeah, yeah, get what I'm saying. That makes sense. And so once the realization is there for me, and I, and I, and you know, he's quick. The scriptures say to let mm -hmm. it go. So the idea here is 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 for the for that person to know that you know of the mercy that you are exhibiting. You're ready and waiting to let that person know. Your heart is it has already uh, forgiven that person. You're and you're waiting if if they come to you with it to let them know that it's already done. Right. But it's not. It's not a license. It's, it's been argued. Yeah. I heard it. Yeah, I, heard, I hear exactly what you're saying, but that's just such a legalistic way. I mean, it's kind of like the same question that was asked, uh, you know, who is my neighbor? You know, Amen. Amen. It, it's, it's, <laughs> a, it's the same spirit behind that question of who is my neighbor as it is, then I don't have to forget. I can hold this in my heart against them until they come back to me and that's really not the heart of mercy we don't have that much strength in us to be holding all of this unmerciful stuff in our hearts and anger in our hearts and then somebody come back to me and say will you forgive me and then i just okay and i just let all that go no it doesn't even work like that you know that's that's a that's a part of of the makeup that christ puts in us the readiness to forgive the readiness to give mercy, 
but the, but I can't give you something that you don't want. So if I'm the if I'm the perpetrator of it, you can't just forgive me without and I hadn't repented. I mean, it, it doesn't even work like that in the kingdom. Does Yeshua forgive us and we hadn't repented? Right. So the whole text of that scripture is saying, you be ready to forgive. But they've got to come and ask you for it so you can give it. <laughs> <laughs> and so Yeshua is waiting you know, I mean, okay, let's I'm involved, I'm involved in, in, in all kinds of stuff, right? Why would I expect Yeshua to have already just let it go of me while I'm in the midst of doing what I'm doing? Is there not an awakening that has to happen in me that I gotta turn to him and say I was wrong? Lord forgive me. Mm -hmm. And then he turned around and said, Okay, I was just waiting on you. Mm -hmm. So I'm gonna give you the mercy that you have requested. So that's the that's the context of that. That we have to be ready and prepared in our hearts to forgive. And when that person comes back, then we're already able and capable of giving mercy because we ourselves have received mercy. Precisely, it's the picture of the prodigal. Right. It just it just doesn't work like. I'm going to harbor all this stuff in me against you. And then when you come to me, I'm just going to let it go. That's not even the heart of, of what we're doing. So it doesn't make sense, you know? Right. Yeah. So so those three, those, those four words, take heed to yourselves. Me, that's the hinge right there. Because he's telling you, I know what can build up in your heart. I'm just paraphrasing in my own word, but I know what can build up in your heart. So you need to take heed to yourselves. Why? Because everything that we've been studying thus far could happen to you as well. Mm -hmm. If you're not heed to yourself, that's just all. Forgive me. I just wanted to, I just want to throw that out there because I have heard that argument before. I know many of us have, but it's, I think it's important to clear that kind of stuff up so that we can pave the way to being righteous before the most high. Thank you. I'll I, I concede. Right, yeah, yeah. And, and, and it has to be brought out. But when he, you know, but the whole against the the whole backdrop of scripture, it just doesn't, uh, it it doesn't make sense to you know that 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 would make sense. You know, our Father who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. Thy will be done uh, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as as we as. <laughs> <laughs> and <Ooh>. we forgive. <laughs> that's that's all I'm saying. It it just it and it, it you know and because we twist everything up to uh, to to accommodate our own flesh, we're gonna miss a lot of things. And, and a lot of us just don't want to forgive, and so we're trying to find excuses not to forgive. You know, we want to out. That's it. Yeah, that part. All right. Is it Hank? I don't need to say anything. You just uh, made the point I was going to reference the scripture in the prayer, you know, that we are to forgive others as we have been forgiven. That's how we've been taught to pray. So uh, you made that point. Thank you. Okay. Great, great lesson. All right. Yeah. I mean, that's uh, that's why he says, love the Lord thy God with all our heart, you know, and our soul and our mind. So let's get me and you straight first. And I, I need you to understand by having a relationship with me, all of the the extent of the grace and mercy that I have extended toward you. Because there's no way a person can get to know the most high and not see his grace and his mercy. You can't get in the presence of the most high. You can't see yourself in comparison to the most high and not see how foul you are. It's just impossible. And so when we get in his presence and we get and we see how foul we are, it, you know, and then and the extent of the grace that he gives us and the mercy that he gives us. And it's because, you know, he, you know, he did what he did and he allowed us to to get this grace and mercy. He said, and so now, since me and you are, are getting our relationship again, you see the extent of the grace and mercy that I have extended toward you. 
then you all are see now to love your neighbor as you do yourself because they're in the same boat as you were in. And so the same grace and the same mercy that it took for me to allow you to be a part of the kingdom, that same grace and that mercy, it, you know, it, it takes for them to get in. And he said, so whatever they did to you, if if you're saying that that was enough to keep them out, now I've got to look at what you did and say it was enough to keep you out. If them stealing your boyfriend in high school was enough to keep them out of the kingdom, <laughs> then shouldn't whatever you did be enough to keep you out? I, I just, I'm just trying to put it in, in trivial terms because we hold grudges against people for the most small things. So what is it that, that a person would want somebody else to be condemned for? and they deserve that, then put that on yourself. You Looking at the speck of sawdust in someone else's eye while we got a whole log in ours. Mm. Yeah, and I'm telling you, self, uh, you know, self-evaluation is key. You know, and then you begin to see for yourself how, how awful and vile you've been. And so now you don't have really the justification to hold... Uh, that too uh, against someone else and what that does is if you're struggling with it it requires you to go before the most high and say look i'm struggling with this thing what this person did yeah you gotta be honest with him and he's gonna help you through that to see why you should let that thing go on that person all right samson uh, shalom 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 everybody hey elder i was uh uh less than um also and you was taught you was uh given similarities um of the book like giving giving credibility to it and and, it, and uh i i was I'm, I'm i was reading i finished it i was reading the vision of paul um and not the apocalypse of paul I, i'm gonna read the apocalypse of paul too i but think it's I was, the same I, it's the same one it's the same mm -hmm. it okay. just called, yeah it's just called two different names okay i i got to uh so I wanted to run this by you and, and see what y'all think. I, I got to a verse uh, or paragraph 41 and 42, and I find it like eerily fascinating how there's different levels of torture. And when I got to uh, chapter or verse or paragraph 41 and 42, it was talking about this, where Paul was talking about, uh, uh, he thought he saw it all. And the angel said, nah, this, this, this ain't nothing. Come look at this. And he brought them to where the seal was. And he was like, okay, you spoke of it today about the stench of the seal. He was like, step back. Because well, when I lift this seal, I don't want any of that stink to get on you. And it brought me to Revelation uh, 20 with, with, regarding that seal. With verse 3, he was talking about uh, um, that bottomless pit. I believe that was bottomless pit. And then, uh, let me see, verse seven, it says, and, and then a thousand years was expired. Uh, and then when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed out of his prison. And what was funny in the, in the vision of Paul, this, this pit was reserved for those who didn't confess uh, that Christ came in the flesh and was born through uh, Miriam. And, and it, it reminded me of Matthew 4, when when uh, Satan said, "If thou be the son of uh, Yah, do so and so," and that was Satan not believing as well, which makes him in, uh, go into that pit as well. And I was wondering, is, is that far off? I, I believe in the vision of Paul, he called it the um, the well of abyss, and it seems similar to Revelation twenty, uh, with, with the. Uh, with that seal prior to the lake of fire. Is that all? I mean, it's not too far off. And that's why we're going in, in layers with the, with the lesson. And, uh, you know, and so we're going to get there so that we can put it in, in context. But, you know, when we went over the summary uh, in the lesson one of this, we kind of discussed it a little bit, but there's different layers, 
layers to the thing. But when you get all the way down to that area down there, you know, it has seven seals on it. And it said if mm -hmm. he cl if he closed that seal up, he's for you're forgotten forever. So those are for those who who will never accept Christ, who who will never, you know, uh, you know, be redeemed. You know, that's where they're going, and he's going to close that, and he's going to seal it up, and they're going to be forgotten. It's going to be like they oh. never existed. But when he opened it for Paul, and Paul was like, you know, what are these souls? He said these are the souls that that didn't believe uh, uh, Yeshua came in the flesh and through Miriam or Mary. Right. And it, it seemed like Revelation, because we didn't know in Revelation what level of torture it is. And, and that's the same level of torture that's reserved for Satan. Right. Prior to the lake of fire. So is, is it like paralleling the same thing where we're like, okay, we getting names to this, names to these tortures? Well, I'm not exactly clear on the question uh, in context of how you're seeing it. But what I am saying is that, you know, that that particular area is reserved for those who would never accept the most high. Mm, okay. And, you All know, right. it's the area as it goes further, you know, is even the uh, angels that rebel. You know, all those who would never receive redemption, and at the end of the at the end of the book of Revelation, he's going to cast that area, uh, uh, you know, hell, all of it into the lake of fire. So, the lake okay. of fire is the final destination. But he's going to take all of that area that, that he's going to seal seal up. He's going to take it and cast all of it into the lake of fire. So, okay. So, last one is is this pit? With with the stank on it, is this the one that you can be falling for fifty years before you drop? Uh, I think it's one before that. It's the one before. The that. one before. Okay. All right. Thanks, Doc. All right. Uh, he said he said you could fall for five hundred years and still <laughs> and never hit, hit the bottom. The, bottom. <laughs> <laughs> it, it, the, the Samson's reference to the different levels reminds me of uh, Dante's Inferno, that painting where he depicts the different levels of hell or purgatory where as you go down further and further there are different levels of, of, of uh, torture or whatever you want to call it that you're subjected to yeah and so we're gonna we're gonna get into those uh in the next couple of lessons so uh you know we wanted to hit the you know the, the upper the upper areas first so we can get an understanding of what's going on here and then it gets worse so so, you know, and that's why I'm going I'm doing it this route so we won't put all those things into the same same category. So we can start thinking of it, you know, in in different uh layers. All right, any other questions? Yeah, I got one more. Okay. So, um Revelation 14 Mm -hmm. Um, I, I'm just curious to get your take on this one as well. Where it says um, Revelation 14 and um, 10, it says, "In the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of Yah, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels, and in the presence of the Lamb, and the smoke of their torment ascended up forever." And ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast or his image and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. So this seems to me to be a very distinct and separate punishment for those who worship the beast. Right. Of revelations. Something that's not even spoken of in what we're reading presently in the vision of Paul. Correct? Um. I think it's spoken of. We just had to, you know, uh, had to pull it well, out. Sometimes we so, haven't so, identified as yet. Yeah, we hadn't identified it yet. Okay. But, but yeah. This is... Yeah, ahead, so, so what, yeah, I mean, so what's happening here, you know, leading up to this, I think is is the key to, to, to understanding what this scripture is, is saying. Mm -hmm. Leading up to Revelation 14, we've seen on several occasions already where the Most High has said, no matter what he put on them, they won't repent. 
All right, so we get to this point, and now there's a clear distinction between those who will repent and those who won't. And these people take the mark, and the mark is really, uh, you know, in in the, in the simplest form, is accepting eternal life in the flesh. So you, you're accepting an alternate form of salvation. Mm -hmm. And you're saying that this B system can do it for me. So you've accepted a whole nother system. And this is why the Most High sends down all these angels and telling the saint, don't take the mark. You get what I'm saying? Is it? And, mm -hmm. and so people are willing to be beheaded. They're willing to be tortured. They're willing to be you know destroyed to refuse the mark because the mark represents a whole nother kingdom. Mm -hmm. And so these people who have accepted the mark have are now part and they're not, some of them are not even human anymore. Mm -hmm. So That's exactly. <laughs> so it's, 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 and so now, so yeah, of course they're going to be designated to the area that Samson was talking about. The seven, one with the seven seals on it, the one that's going to be sealed up. He said, when you get sealed up in there, you're not even going to be remembered by the most high and more. You just made a good point there. Uh, Kendall, where you talked about them not being human. Um, everyone is looking for the chip. Everyone is looking for the tattoo. And one of the things that the Holy Spirit keeps putting on my heart is transhumanism, where we, you know, and I have this conversation with a lot of people that Christ came for the son of man, uh, for the sons of Adam, i.e. the human race, those made in the image of, of, of the creator, and those who became hybrids or hybridized during the time of Enoch, the time of Noah, they were not saved. Uh, Noah and his family were saved, but those who uh, were there and after the flood were killed out and God had no mercy on those individuals. And, I, and, I, and part of the conversation I have with people is that, you know, this mark could potentially be some sort of... Um, and this is a whole different topic, but, you know, just to kind of piggyback off what you were saying, that this mark may potentially be some alteration of the human DNA where you are no longer a human being. And Christ did not come to die, die and, you know, forgive the sins of chimeras and hybridized people, you know, made in the image of a beast or animal or, you know, some sort of other thing. So it was just interesting that you said that. And that was one of the things that was in my mind with this door that was sealed and you're forgotten and you'll never, there's no redemption for you uh, once you take that mark. So I, I appreciate that. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a big deal, you know, and it, you know, and that's why, you know, and, and, and that's why I'm saying we got to go, we got to get a little bit look deeper on that because that's what, that's what the most high was doing when we went into uh, when Joshua led us back into uh, the promised land. Mm -hmm. Yes, and the yes. people, the people that we were fighting, uh, you know, they were part, you know, ne they they were Nephilim, some of them were part animal, part human, you know, it was just really bad. And so when he when he would say go in there and destroy all of them, he had a purpose behind that. These were not his seed; they were never going to be his seed. Uh, you know, he said get rid of all of them. You know, the, the, they're you know they're they're mingled with animals. They're mingled. I mean, it was just awful stuff. And that's why he instructed Israel, don't marry any of the Canaanites. You know, <laughs> you know, and so we don't want to deal with those type things, but it's going to happen again. That's why I'm putting out those videos about what these Ooh. people are doing genetically when they're mixing half animals, half, uh, you know, humans together and all they, they, they said it out loud. This is not something I'm just making up. This is going mm -hmm. on now. So, um, so there's a lot there, you know, and so uh, we had to understand that. And so by the time the beast system comes, it's, you know, you read stuff like the apocalypse of, uh, you know, the, uh, apocalypse of Elijah and stuff like that. And uh, it may even be in, uh, the second Ezra, I had to find it again, where it said they're going to take the Gentile women will be breastfeeding the beast that, that they're having by the, um, uh, by the Nephilim. So this is real. Uh, these 
that what and they're doing it now. Mm, oh, oh. So yeah, we we just we don't we don't get it because we're arguing about do I have to forgive somebody? <laughs> you know, so we can't get past that nonsense. You know, to really get in depth of what's really going on. Uh, you it, know, it it's it it sort of reminds me of the time when Saul went in and was told to destroy everything, even the animals, and then he brought back the best and thought that he was doing the right thing, and and uh, the prophet. I believe it was Samuel told him, no, you know, what is this, you know, bleeding of sheep and long of cattle that I hear? You know, I told you to go in and destroy everything. And because you didn't do it, uh, you know, Lord has rejected you as king. And, you know, to your point, uh, Brother Kendall, you know, all the, the things people were doing to and with animals, they are no longer holy and needed to be destroyed. And, uh, you know, just in terms of God sending the, you know, the Israelites into these, these places and saying, destroy every single thing. And, and, and people are always like, well, if God is such a loving God, why did he say destroy, you know, all these people and all these things? But without this context that you're putting in these, you know, the Apocalypse of Paul and all these other, you know, uh, quote unquote, non-canonical books, you don't get the full picture of why God is such a holy God and why he says to destroy all these things because they're an abomination to him. Right. And they, they've even used this as a case against our Elohim. Say, oh, look at him. You know, he's evil. You know, he's just, he's just killing everybody. He's a murderous God. And all this stuff they say against him and they don't, un, you know, without understanding and because we don't understand, we came and put an argument up against it. So, all right, any other questions? All right, Miss Sylvia. Um, you mentioned Hello, Sister Oh, go ahead. Oh, go ahead, sis. I'm done. <laughs> Shalom. Uh, I just wanted to uh, give a reaction, actually. To, I'm listening and I'm listening to the brotherhood and your discussion and I'm just I'm just I'm just elated that the most high have chosen and decided to you walk to you to utilize you all to search this this the canon that is a puzzle because we know all the information is not there and how he is using you all to, to fill in and to find and to research and to try to bridge the gap to give us a complete plot of what is what we have to work with and to know what the most high is expected of us. And I'm just want to say thank you. And um, I'm glad that I'm here because it's, because the Holy Spirit is also working with me and showing me, you know, um, how to stay close to him, to read between the lines and to hear his word, hear the Holy Rock when it's trying to direct and show me something. And But I'm thankful for the teachers and the preacher that is within, especially this group, that is given guidance to be able to do that. So... Shalom and Sabbath for your for your um, words. Yeah, all praises, all praise to the Most High. You know, we get in the in the books, and this is in their books. And I'll say this, and we'll we can really get out of here. But you know, even when we went into um, Spain, you know, there was a group of people that came in, and uh, I think it was the Castiles. The Argons, you know, anyway, the families of, of that area who who call themselves blue bloods. And they said they didn't want to mix with the black bloods. Uh -oh. and, and they said, and they, this is in their writings. I'm not making this up. They said that they were brought to Spain. Uh, you know, that their 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 gods brought them in from somewhere else and sell them in Spain. This is this is what they said. So uh I'm just going by what they said. So they're saying to us that they're from something else. 
And then if you understand that context, then you can understand why they have this, this hostility toward Yah's people. If they're from something else and they claim to be from something else. I'm not saying what I think. I'm not making it up. This is what they say in their own writings. So. <laughs> it's what Alexander the Great said. He gave his, his lineage to the gods. Who he came from. On his mama's side, that's that's what they said. I'm just going by what they said. So we can believe them or not believe them. All right, anybody else? So they wouldn't be considered sheep then? If if they're gonna be considered anything, they'd be considered goats. So they won't be able to hear the most high. Them. Well, he has a select amount of goats that he's going to allow into the kingdom. Okay. Yep, that's an interesting topic, but it's, it's there. All righty. <laughs> Everybody running around out there talking about they the goat. <laughs> no, thank you. <laughs> All right. Y'all sure y'all ain't got anything else before we get out of here? <laughs> All right, so go ahead and, and and continue to read and study the Apocalypse of Paul. And we're going to continue to study that. Y'all willing, you know, I might put another lesson or so out, uh, you know, this week. So we'll, we'll just go from there and we'll see what he allows. All righty. Well, let's get ready to get out of here and, uh, uh, so I want everybody to pray for Chanel's dad. He's in he's in the hospital. Uh, so uh, keep them lifted up. Tough to be in the hospital on Father's Day. So keep him uh, lifted up. Uh, keep keep her family lifted up. All right. All right. So let's pray. Father, we just want to thank you for this day, this opportunity that you allowed us to come together one more time. Uh, to search out your word, Father, we just want to thank you for giving us the Holy Ruach to lead us into all truth. We want to thank you for for explaining it to us, to give us the vision of what you're saying, to compare your word to, to li uh, line upon line, precept upon precept, so we can see uh, the discernment that you uh, are giving us to decipher uh, the word. We just want to thank you. We know it's all your grace and all your mercy, Father. Help us to examine ourselves. Help us to judge ourselves. So in your words, you say, if we judge ourselves, we will not be judged. Forgive us for our many sins. Cleanse us from all unrighteousness. In your son, Yeshua's name we pray. Amen. Amen. Happy Father's Day, gentlemen. Happy, Happy Father's, Father's Day, Day, everybody. Father's I was going to say Day. that. Happy Father's Day. Day. We love y'all. Happy Father's Day. Shalom. All right. Shalom. Shalom. All right. Shalom. 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 Now, I believe that the feast day cards are a powerful tool for three major reasons. Uh, number one, the Messiah fulfilled and will continue to fulfill his uh, redemptive work surrounding these particular days. The feast days are actually the only biblical holidays or holy days that he affirms in scripture, not Easter, Christmas, Valentine's. You know, those days are actually dedicated to other gods. And number two, prophecy. Uh, these cards present teaching moments. And uh, one of the main emphasis on the card is prophecy. So the third reason that these cards are so powerful is that when possible, we have actual historical representations of true Israel. We also include on the cards where the images are now located. So this is an opportunity to discuss the meaning of the feast days uh, from a messianic perspective. Also, it's a teaching moment on specific prophecies, and it also opens up discussions about the images of true Israel.